I want to speak a little bit this morning on a culture of generosity toward his mission and what that looks like. Psalm 49, verse 15. Stand with me, if you will, in honor of the reading of God's word. Verse 15 is kind of a standalone, and it's the view of an individual that understands where they will spend eternity. Uh, God has done something in their life, and they've been redeemed. And then he, he sort of changes gears as he moves into verse 16, and it takes the view of an individual that really is living for this life only. So I would like to do a major contrast and just say, boy, what a contrast it is when there's an individual that realizes that this is just a life you're passing through, but we're going to live forever, not so long from now, for most of us, uh, in another place. And then to realize that we ought to embrace this life in light of that life. And then we're going to take a look. The major contrast is an individual is being described that only sees this life. Here's my concern. After pastoring for 37 years, there's a lot of people that embrace verse 15 but live in the context of verse 16 and following. They're headed to another country. All of their family and friends and the people in the other nations and neighbors will know nothing about the land that they will inherit unless we begin to make disciples, reproduce ourselves and others. But we're living as though this is just it. We spend our money as though it's just this life. We, we spend our life as though it's just this life. We use our talents as though it's just for this life. And so with that in mind, I wanted to set it up. Now, listen to the language, beginning in verse 15. But God will redeem my soul. Can I get a witness? Anybody, God's redeemed your soul? Means he paid a ransom on the cross. He redeemed my soul. And then he says this, from the power of the grave, I have, I have no fear. I really don't. God is my witness. I have no, power, no fear of the grave. Uh, whenever that time is, whether it's in a few days or many years from now, I have been redeemed, and so he has kicked the back end of the grave out. Uh, the grave couldn't hold him, and I thank God it won't even, I don't even have to visit it. Uh, my body will return to dust, but I'm telling you, when I'm absent from this body, I will be present with the Lord. Uh, every time I read Adrian Rogers' uh, Twitter account, it says he's in glory, kicking up gold dust. That's where I'm headed. But it's because I've been redeemed. Now. How then should I live? How then should I serve? How then should I use spiritual gifts as a result of this? Now, he says, for he shall receive me. In other words, when this life is over, uh, the grave has no power over me. My soul's been redeemed. And listen, when he says he'll receive me, it means he'll welcome me. There's coming, there's going to be a great welcoming on the other side where the Lord Jesus will say, Father, this one's with me. That's why I died on Calvary. And then he uses that little word, Selah. And the little word simply means, think about this. And if you think about it very long, you'll shout more. Ponder this. Now he changes gears. Look at verse number 16. Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house increased, this life only. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lives, listen to this language. Had you ever seen this verse? He blesses himself. Most people that have a lot keep a lot. In fact, this is nationally factual. Facts are our friends. The more an individual makes, the less percentage the individual gives. You would think, you know, somebody says, boy, I just wish, I wish I just had the, the capacity to do this and this and this. And this is, this is Luke 16.10. If you don't do with a little bit what burdens you that you wish you had a lot for, if you had a lot, you wouldn't do any more for it. JMH translation. And so the Bible says, why he lives, he blesses himself. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. 
Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits who redeems the soul from the grave. Verse 15, which is Psalms 103, verse 1 and 2. If God has blessed me, I should bless God. And if God has blessed me, I should bless others. That's what missions is, using my life, using my talents, using my resources to bless the kingdom of God. But it says, though he lives, he blesses himself. And some people are so generous to themselves. Uh, they don't just do anything for themselves. And then look what happens, parenthetically. For men will praise you when you do well for yourself. Man, he's done good. Hey, did you see the contract that guy signed the other day with his sports team? Do you hear the conversation in the church? Man, I tell you, God's blessed him. Really? When God ultimately blesses a person with great riches, it's not what he puts in his bank account. It's what he puts in his account in the bank in glory on the other side. That's the ultimate. And so he, it says, and listen to this, verse 19, he shall go to the generations of his father and they shall never see light. They'll never see light again. Enjoy the light here because he's saying you're going to a place that's going to be ultimately dark. That is when you only live for this life. But when he redeems your soul, you're not going to spend your life just blessing yourself. You're going to bless others. Father, speak into our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I wrote sort of a, a, just a sentence, a longer sentence, and I want you to track with me on this sentence because I use it as an introductory statement. It simply says this, when our greatest joy is loving God, our greatest joy is loving God. How? By laying aside the weights of self-preoccupation, by denying ourselves, looking unto Jesus who is our life, and giving life to others by saving, serving him, then we will begin living life really abundantly. We talk about our DNA, and it's one thing for us to say what it is, it's another thing for others. The Bible says, let another man praise you, not your own lips, even a stranger. Proverbs chapter 27 in verse 2. Let me tell you what I know about this life. I've only got so much time. And the question is, what am I going to do with the time that God has given me? How will I use my time? And God has really ministered, and I'll go just far enough, uh, John, to show you uh, some, some stewardship principles God showed me this week about my life as it pertains to ministry. So when I think about <clears throat> the lordship, relationship, and stewardship, three key words, and they're easy to remember because they all start with T's. And that is time. You know, I, I, I don't know how much time I've got, but I know I've got right now, and I want to use it in a way to glorify God. I have talents. When I became a Christian, God gave me spiritual endowments called spiritual gifts, and I want to use my gifts to bring Him glory and to build up the body of Christ. So I am actively involved here among my neighbors and among the nations with the gifts God has given me, with the time God has given me. But let me give you something else. And, and you've heard me say this before. The third one, I never dreamed that I would really have much to have to worry about, but God chose to bless. I have treasures. I can say with Augustine, I hope you remember this. I keep saying it. Augustine said, God has been good to me. He's given me more than I need. <clears throat> He's given me more than I need, but he's shown me others that need it. And so I'm constantly being involved in other people's lives because God has been good to me. So Jesus teaches so much about being generous. So, so how, how does God develop a culture, a culture of generosity in our hearts toward his mission? Like, like what am I doing in my life with my time, my talents, and my treasures that embraces his mission? That is, if he's redeemed me, he's going to welcome me on the other side. I'm here for a short time. And so I used his time, and as Rick Warren said, this life is just a dress rehearsal for eternity. If that's true, if I'm just here to make a difference in this life for the next life, it's, it's really all about the next life, if that's true. What am I doing with what God has given me in this life? <clears throat> Matthew 6, 21, Jesus made this statement. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Have you ever heard me say this? Had I been writing that, or even when you try to memorize it, if you don't get it in your mind, really word for word, it's easy to misquote it. Let me tell you how my heart wants to quote it. My heart wants to say, for where your heart is, 
there will your treasure be. Because, you know, my heart said, man, I got a heart for this, so I put my money there. But the Bible actually says you can put your treasure places and your heart will follow. Well, why is that? Well, I, I never had a heart for Haiti until I started putting treasure there. I didn't have a heart for Kenya until I started putting treasure. I didn't have a heart for Romania, Ukraine, Russia until my heart was there. I didn't have a heart for India. I didn't have a heart for Iraq. I didn't care to go into Iran. I weren't, I weren't interested in training Iranian leaders until I began to invest and put my, my money there. So I wrote a statement this week. Here's, here's how it goes. Treasure decisions, treasure decisions precede the heart's location and devotion. My, my treasures have landed in places before my heart got there. That's a good statement. Let that settle in. That's why I wrote it in, in my notes this morning. Treasure decisions precede the heart's location and the, the devotion. So the where and the why came after the fact that I'd already gotten committed. And so question has to be asked this morning. Now, let's, let's do it. Let's just act like you and I were here, and I want to pose a personal question. In Jesus' name, not what you want to be, but what are you? Are you an outward-focused Christian or an inward-focused Christian? Do you spend more time thinking about what you don't have and you need, or do you think about what you can do to assist others who don't have and who need? So faithful with what you have precedes generosity with what you will have. I don't want to live my life saying, if I can ever get here, this is what I want to do. No, if it means anything to me, I want to do everything I can to change things in my life the way they are so I can accommodate what really mean the most to me. Jesus put it this way in Luke 16, 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. By the way, that's interesting how he changed the language. If you will, put that verse back up for just a moment, if you would be so kind. Notice that it says, when you're doing the least, you're faithful. When you're not doing the least, you're unjust. I'm a just man because the justice of God was served on God's Son, Jesus Christ. So I could experience God's generosity in grace and mercy and compassion. And boy, might I add, God has been so generous in the way he has debbied out his marvelous grace to forgive me of not part of my sins, but he paid all my debt. All of my sins were nailed to the cross. And so since they were, I'm a just man. I do not want to be referred to as unjust. I don't want to be un unjust in my time. I don't want to be unjust in my talents. I don't want to be unjust in my treasures. I want to be a faithful man, a faithful man. And then I wrote, a, every now and then I just write a statement. So I wrote one-liners. Here's two one-liners. Greed is a heart disease. Generosity is a heart transformation. And, and let me just say something to you. I'm wise enough as a biblical teacher to know that generosity can only come because God transforms the heart. So we've been saying we're going to go deeper. We're staying right in it, even though this is missions day. So let me just take a couple of minutes and talk about how we must deal with narcissism, how we must deal with narcissism. I want to do two things, and this is as far as I'll get. I, I want to just talk this morning about narcissism defined. Now, remember, narcissism is a temptation to be. It's what I want to be. I'm not thinking about what others could be with my aid. It's more about whatever I have in life, I'm using it to bless me. When I die, people will talk more about what I had instead of what I gave. Has anyone in this room ever heard the name Mother Teresa? Okay, two of you. All right, but anyway, uh, <laughs> you didn't know we were voting. All right, you've heard Mother Teresa. Was Mother Teresa... Did she become famous for what she had or for what she gave? What she gave. People are not remembered for what they have. 
There's nothing significant when this life is over about what you had. But when people assemble at a cemetery, or if they come to our funeral, then they'll go to the cemetery, then they'll come back to the church and eat chicken. And when they're eating chicken, they'll say something like this. I've got a Mother Teresa story. And they'll put your name there. Here's what I think of when I think of my friend, this brother, this sister that just went to be with the Lord. Uh, narcissism, where did the word narcissism come from? What a word. The term narcissism originated with Narcissus in Greek mythology who fell in love with his own image as he viewed it in a pool of water. We don't fall in love with ourselves by looking at our image of a pool of water because we're not in Greek mythology. We fall in love with ourselves as we look at ourselves every day in the mirror. And we look there and think about what we need. How do you define narcissism? It's an inordinate fascination of oneself. You ever heard someone say, that person really is gifted, and someone else say, yeah, and they really know it. It's narcissism. It's an expressive self-love. It's vanity. It's self-centeredness. I'll tell you how I can define it so well, because I've dealt with it. Matter of fact, I believe anybody that breathes the breath of life will deal at some level with narcissism, but it moves into a, a smugness. The only reason everybody else don't have as much as I have is because they just don't work as hard as I do. It's all about you. It's an egotism, it's a pride. I was reading something on discipleship last night, and this is an interesting question. Have you ever said, God, I've often wondered why you allowed me to be born to the family I was born to, in the place I was born uh, with, and with the family having what they had? What if you had been born in Haiti, the poorest country in the world? Would you still have become the leader that you are? How well would you have done there? I'm telling you, everything about life, everything you paint on the lifescape of life, you see the hand of God bringing you to where you are in order to use you. Wait a minute. In order to use you, unless God is a respecter of persons, in order to use you to go to the others of the world. It only makes sense that the Christian life is because he wants us to replicate his life to the nations and to our neighbors. Narcissism must be viewed in light of this life and in light of eternity. He's redeemed us. Well, let me just be honest with you. How, how can we embrace his vision? How can God develop a culture of generosity in my heart for the nation so that I'm constantly looking at what I have and asking God, what he'd have me to give. One of the first verses I memorized many years ago was from Hebrews 12, where the Bible says, therefore, seeing we're so compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses surrounded, let every one of us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here it is, looking to Jesus. And let me tell you what it means there. The word that's used for looking means that God can actually turn your heart, transform it, where you look away from everything else and God focuses you in and you just know this becomes your mission, that you've got to be involved. Some level, you've got to make a difference for God's glory. See, self-preoccupation leads to discouragement. You know, you get to focus on yourself a while, no wonder there's so many people filling the psychiatrist's offices. We spend all of our time looking at ourselves, that can lead to discouragement and despair. It's disappointing because we never find in ourselves what we're looking for, but we never were supposed to. And so we're then often lured into this self-centered introspection, which leads us in this vicious cycle of self-improvement efforts, self-indulgent and self-delusionments, and new self-resolves. But remember, the very essence of being on mission with the Lord is loving and worshiping God while loving and serving others. I wrote these three statements down, and then I made a couple of statements about them. Number one, I want to give my life 
to count. I really want my life to count. I mean, you just got to make that decision, first of all. I'm here for a short while. I want my life to count. So let me tell you what that, how you're going to have to translate that. Time given. So stewardship. There's going to have to be time in my schedule. Most people that say there's coming a day I will be able to do that, I bet most never will because the time never comes. And if it's so important that you're reflecting on it now, it's probably something that should be obeyed. And you do it at the level of where you are now. And so I want my life to count, time given. Number two, I want my God-given gifts. God's given me some talents. I have some gifts. I really do, and I know what they are. I know where my strengths are. And, and let me say this, I don't just not work in the areas of my weakness. I use my strengths to overcompensate. So I want to count. So what does that mean? Talents given. So what do I do? I preach, I teach, I serve, I encourage, I listen, I disciple, I try to be a friend. And so my major gift is encouragement so I can sit down with people. And through God's truth, I use my gift and I encourage them. So I want to use, but number three, I want my resources to count. That's my treasures. God has given, I'm an empty nester now. God's given me resources. I've not wasted money. I've saved a lot of money. So for 40 years of my life, I've never walked inside the church building without having an envelope with a, with a minimum of 10% of all of my gains, any royalties from books, any speaking engagements, anything God gives me, everything that comes my way. So let me give you a passage, and I'll use this to wrap it up with. And I want you to follow along with this passage on the, script, on the uh, screens. Here it is. It's Ecclesiastes. I've been reading Ecclesiastes devotionally. And so God really spoke into my life. So here's what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. So if you've got some money and you want to get more, I just want to tell you something. It ain't going to satisfy. You never have enough. He who loves abundance with increase, you'll never, never will it satisfy. All vanity, he says it's empty. He uses this language. It's like trying to grasp the wind in your hand. Just, just try to catch it. Get you a handful. You got it? Got you a handful of air? That's what he says it's like. He says, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. They're there blessing themselves. So what profit has the owner except to see them with their eyes? Here it is. Look what I've got. Let me show it to you. Check it out. The sleep of a laboring man. Somebody just works hard. It's sweet whether he eats a little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. He spends all of his waking hours trying to make it, and then he can't sleep because he's scared he's going to lose it. So he sits there and turns in bed at night. What's going to happen with the market tomorrow? It's real estate going up, coming back down. What's going to happen with the banking industry? There is a severe evil, which I've seen under the sun. And by the way, you may say, Pastor, you're not qualified to speak to this. No, but Solomon is. He's the richest and wisest man that ever lived. Riches, this is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. Riches kept for their owner to their hurt. My Bible says if God's given you a lot and you're not thinking about others and his kingdom, the money you've got will hurt you. Now, that, that'll be good, won't it? Every Sunday, I give you an opportunity to not get hurt this week. Someone says, is he taking an offering every time we come to church? Yep, why? He just don't want us to hurt ourselves. He's looking out for us. But you keep it. It'll hurt you. But those riches perish through misfortune. It's going to be gone anyway. You're not going to take it with you. When he begets a son, there's nothing in his hand. I'll tell you what really you put in a son's hand is the fact that you're teaching them to give. You're teaching them to love God. As he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return. That means he's taken nothing with him to go as he came. He shall take nothing from his labors, which he may carry away in his hands. And this also is severe evil. Just exactly as he came, he shall go. 
What profit has he who has labored for the wind? You've labored for no reason. I'm laboring, listen to this, I'm laboring so I can join God in his kingdom endeavor of touching neighbors and nations. I am working and taking an income and trying to be a faithful steward with it to see how God wants me to distribute it for the glory of God. All his days, he also, listen to this, he eats in darkness and he has much sorrow and sickness and anger. He is what I have seen. Here's what I've seen. He is good and fitting for one to eat and to drink. Listen to this and enjoy the good of all his labors in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life. Listen to this, which God gives him. God gives him. Everything you are here this morning, your breath, what you're wearing, where you live, everything you have, God gave it to you. And he said, this is your portion. This is your, your heritage. And he says, for as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his, his portion and rejoice in his labor. This is, this is a gift of God. Uh, how did you get to where you are? God, why did God uh, gift this person more than the other? I don't know, because he's God. He can do what he wants to. Why did he let you be born here instead of Haiti? Why, why were you born here instead of among the Messiah that lived in cow dung houses? in Kenya. I can't answer those questions. I just know that you are gifted by God. But here's where God really spoke to me, and I'll wrap it up. For he will not unduly, uh, he, he will not dwell unduly, excessively on the days of his life. And, and, and basically, I, I was making some notes. I want to I want to look at that. I want to make sure you understand it because I wanted to, I was intrigued by this passage. What he's saying, he will not often consider the days of his life. You don't just go around thinking, how many more days do I have? So notice the last part. This is where God really spoke to me. He will not dwell excessively or always considering the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. And I want to be honest with you. This is how I feel. Just look this way. This is how I feel. I feel like I'm busy with the joy of his heart. I really do. And what are you doing? What are you doing again? I'm preaching, I'm speaking into people's lives. What are you doing going out? Another meal, another meal. I just wanna care for people when I wanna speak into their life. And I'm not there. God's still working and, and just you know, honing me in so I can make a more significant difference in the areas that I'm serving in. And it's the same thing with you. So I celebrate what God is doing with you. Only heaven knows how much of a blessing so many of you have chosen to be in speaking into my own life. But God keeps him busy with the joy, joy, deep inner serenity. This fires your soul. You feel alive when it's God's joy in you that causes you to do what you do. Heavenly Father, create within us a culture of generosity for your mission, for your mission, what you want us to do. What does that look like in my individual life? Continue to draw me closer to you and keep me busy with the joy of my heart. But God, may it be your busyness and not mine. Help me to be able to discern between Johnnyism and Jesus' will.